I was just going to ask you, what, how much have you guys seen of Next and what do you think of it? Uh, I haven't seen her. Tell us about so. it. Uh, well, I, like I said, I got the in on the play test, so I have the, the PDF copies of the basic rules, um, which is by no means a complete thing. It has a one page how to play thing instead of a DMG. Um, and some of the things aren't even complete. It's not a full rule set by any means. But it's pretty interesting. Um, it's more similar to 3.5 than it is to anything else. Um, yeah. With the way the leveling works. But it's, they've made a lot of differences. Um, they took out what a lot of people know as the DM's best friend. Um, it's something that they had in the 3.5 and the 4th edition DMGs. It's a sidebar in both of them and that mentions if you think that conditions are good for the character, give them a plus two bonus on a roll. If they're bad, give them a minus two bonus on a roll. They've taken that away. Um, I mean, they haven't entirely taken it away. You can still do it, obviously. But what they've replaced the bonuses and penalties system with, for the most part, is a thing called advantage and disadvantage. If you have advantage on a roll, you roll two d20s and you take the higher one. If you have disadvantage on a roll, you roll two d20s and take the lower one. It's a really simple system that makes the a lot of the esoteric, well, why is this minus two and this is plus three and if I have, and you know, if I'm balancing on a rope while trying to swing a sword, but I have the boots that make it better, or but I'm falling on a hill that's a minus three and plus two, and, and I end up with, it changes all of that to, ooh, well, advantage, disadvantage, advantage, so I have advantage, roll 2d20s. Um, and so it makes a lot of that stuff a lot easier. It does mean that there's less granularity. Uh, you know, it's harder to give somebody a plus one bonus because advantage is obviously a much bigger bonus than getting just a plus one to a roll, which is a flat 5% increase. So it's a very small dice pool. It, it's kind of like a small dice pool. Um, yeah, your granularity is hidden in the GM's mind. Mm -hmm. He's basically making a decision as to what that granularity is. Yeah, and so your DM does have to come up with a little bit more clever ways to give small bonuses, but big bonuses are, and mini bonuses are handled much more easily in next. Um, also, feats are much more exciting now. You get far fewer of them, and they do, and they have really huge effects, which is a lot of fun. Uh, also, the way that they did multi-classing for spellcasters. Um, if, for those of you who are familiar with 3.5, if you're a spellcaster, you can't multi-class, because then you start losing spells, and it's just terrible, and you will always fall behind no matter what you multi-class into. Well, in D&D Next, they sort of do away with that. If you multi-class, the way you do your spells per day is that you get spell slots based on your total caster level. And your total caster level is calculated by one for every full caster class and one half for every half caster class you have. So if you have you know, two levels of bard, that gives you one caster level, and four levels of mage, they do away with the wizard and sorcerer and combine them into mage. Um, I don't really know why they need the change. I don't know why they couldn't just call it wizard, but hey, I don't, I'm not arsed about it. That would give that would be a level six character with a level five caster class, and you just consult a really simple table for that. And it makes that a lot nicer because you can actually multi class. You can actually be a wizard cleric without losing all of your spells. But it, uh, the highest level spells you are able to access is determined by your level of the individual class. So. It also caps your power out somewhat, but you can also cast spells at a higher level spell slot than they're worth, and some spells actually have a bonus for that, so you aren't totally lost on your high level spell slots. Okay. All right, uh, so, but we were having a retrospective, so any more yeah. questions about the past? Uh, well, I mean, we can certainly talk about any edition of D&D, or we, we can expand the topic so down to... So you start now, I already started. I was in the Navy, this was 1976, and I fell in with a group of college students at the local college, and we were using a photocopy 
top set of the rules until some, one of us got enough money, me, to actually go out and buy them. And we got together and played on like Friday or Saturday nights as duty and studies and jobs would allow. And we had some interesting times. I, mean, I played for through the 80s and kind of then I got married, moved to Atlanta, and moved away from my gaming group. So that's when I, when I stopped. But we also played other, you know, we morphed into other other games. We did, uh, we played GDW's Traveler. And uh, so anything TSR made just about, except for like Boot Hill. Right. Yeah. We, even, we even got into Killer. Wow, okay. uh, GDW game, game, uh, game Science is Killer. Okay. We were live. We were live role playing assassins. Okay, was that with metagaming or games? Uh, no, meta, was it metagaming? Well, it was actually written by Steve Jackson. Yeah, I think it was metagaming at the time. Right. But we got into that, and somehow never managed to get into trouble. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Booby trapping guys' cars. Yeah. We car bomb yeah. whistles and potatoes. A lot of people don't know how um, limited the market Arisio was perceived for Dungeons and Dragons. Back before Dungeons and Dragons came out, even the the, the chainmail rules, okay, there were less than a thousand wargaming enthusiasts in the entire country. So Gygax, when they were producing the rules, they were hoping for a print run of 500. Okay, yes, and, and they they, could, and they would have felt that that market was saturated at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, they were re-releasing new editions of previous rules that they had made. So when uh, when it took off, uh, Gygax, everybody was just totally floored. They had no idea that that was going to happen. And essentially, what you had was a bunch of enthusiasts who really didn't know how to run a business other than a hobby business suddenly being in control of something that was becoming a million dollar concern. And these people were pretty much out to sea. And they made a lot of bad decisions as a result, which you know the, the, their audience, of course, immediately uh, wrote about it in their fanzines. Mm -hmm. uh, because that was the second way that this information got around was through uh, a lot of the fanzines like especially uh, Alarms and Excursions and the Wild Hunt, which was sort of a fallback because things could, uh, Lee Gold, who was the editor of Alarms and Excursions, wasn't accepting all the articles that they were getting because they didn't want to make it too thick. So then all of a sudden we had more of these things spawning out to, uh, to do that. Before that, people had zines, they had APAs, okay? Their, their runs were maybe, oh, you know, maybe 50, 100 people, mm -hmm. not those. All of a sudden, now we're talking two, three, four thousand, five thousand print runs for a fanzine. It's like uh, Game Science went into went into their own thing, but they they published a, a newspaper mm -hmm. every month. I, right. I kept one for a long time just because of the headline. We turn heads reading and say at the airport, mm -hmm. it was we we had a headline said the world, the world, the world. Uh, uh, can't, World Emperor's legions loom large. That's a headline. Right. And you're sitting there reading a newspaper with that kind of a headline, and people start, huh? <laughs> right. And every person who had a, a now, a, a, those of you who are not familiar with an app, a zine, every contributor has basically a small column, uh, a set of pages that they printed and are right. collected. Every single one of them thought that they knew how to run Dungeons and Dragons better than Gary Gygax. Of course. <laughs> okay, and they were, and they thought that everything that they wrote should be official. Mm -hmm. So, so when Gary Gygax came out and said, the only thing that's official is anything that's published in Strategy and Review, which was the TSR House Organ, Later or actually in an edition of Dungeons and Dragons, that's when the whole pushback, the whole thing about uh, copyrights, and everything else started. You know, speaking about how it can run, uh, I was recently, uh, I think it was on RPG Net, um, uh, in the forums, there was there, some guy who had actually played with Guy Jax, back in, Guy Gax? Guy Gax. Guy Gax back in the day. He actually played with him back in the day, said that the way he actually ran it originally was um, the players were sitting in one room and he was in an adjoining room. So they didn't ever actually visually see the, the GM, the DM, when they were playing. They would just hear his voice coming from this other room. 
And so I guess I don't know if that's supposed to be more immersive or something. But no, that's yeah. that's kind of like a, a double blind, a double blind with an umpire yeah. in board war gaming. We have the two opponents in one room, in separate rooms, with the same maps and the same counters and everything, and they run. Through, okay, you make your move. He makes all his moves. The umpire then goes over to the other guy and does the next segment, so that you don't see what's going on until you. It, it, there's no uh, guy of God in the right. sky telling you what's going on. Right. But, but apparently when they were running, he wouldn't even go into their room yeah. as Dungeon Master. He would stay where they could just hear him. And so you know, that's how you play the game. Right. Originally, uh, a lot of effort was made to keep people from actually being able to concretely visualize the adventure they were going on, the dungeon. Uh, you could have a mapper, but they would, the, the GM would not say, well, this is a 10 foot by 10 foot room. He would say, it's a small room that, you know, and it's got a, it's got a quarter that connects it to another room, and that's a bigger room. It's got this in it, that in it. But he, they would not use dimensions. They didn't want you to be able to map properly. They wanted you to be constantly in a state of wonder and terror about what might come out of some spot that they hadn't seen or such. And this was part of the very early game. Hiding information was considered part of the game. And, 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 and of course, back then, Easily, uh, well, they had graph paper, but people, you know, uh, a, a lot of people who were trying to get into the role playing aspect didn't want this, the break of having to run, and draw a and map, and, and the, it took them out of the game. So, a lot of times, people played literally with just writing some clues down on a piece of paper as they went along trying to figure out how to get out. And some people got lost in those dungeons if they were like two or three levels deep. People would be trapped for you know weeks of play sessions before they could finally find their way out. Right. And as the games evolved, I think that um, that I think that, that sort of play and other sorts of play really vary depending on your DM style. Yeah. Um, you know, some people some people are dungeon builders, and so uh, a lot of those people really like. Uh, their players to get to see the dungeon. Mm -hmm. They like their players to get to map it out, and and they get to look down and see their players go, oh, look how clever our DM is. Um, and then some people are world builders, so they kind of like more of the mysterious stuff. Often they'll let people get lost because there's something to be found because you know you've populated the world, you've populated every nook and cranny with some type of magical moss that will do something later on in the story. Um, and, and some people are story writers, and they have this grand, grand architecture, yeah, this grand story to tell. Exactly, that they want their players to go on. So they don't want their and a really big plot lost. lost because <laughs> it, no, so they don't want their players getting away. lost because you know that's going to take away from the story. It's like no, we don't need a lull in the story right now. I'm going to give you a way out. But then later on, they might have them get lost if they want them lost. Sure, but certainly lots of different styles have developed. And one one thing that's kind of interesting that I learned doing a small amount of research is um, in the with Gygax and his group in the early days um, it didn't contain something that most game groups have now which is theatricality um, they didn't speak in character ever. right right uh, it was, they might describe what the character was doing whereas clearly years later there were players who said you know this is great but let's make it more yeah, you know, more into character yeah. into the character yeah. much more role play Right. Well, if it's based on if they if they started like as war gamers, that would be how they do it. Exactly. exactly. The, the concept of actually having a character that you were speaking for in character that that was part of the whole um, evolution of role playing games. I mean, it didn't really exist before. Right. That's true. Good. 